This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Britain announces travel restrictions against South Africa over new COVID-19 variants. Tensions at UK port of Dover as France shuts its borders over fears of a new coronavirus strain. And the Central African Republic citizens ready to vote on Sunday as UN troops help secure voting areas. This is Africa Live. A warm welcome to the show. I am Penina Karibe and joining me with a sneak peek of what's coming up in Business News is Rama. Thank you very much, Penina. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Africa's fuel supplies will be stretched following the closure of two of its biggest domestic refineries. And businesses in Somalia are regaining some momentum after the government lifts pandemic restrictions. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Penina. Thank you, Rama. Britain has announced restrictions on travel from South Africa over the spread of a new variant of coronavirus. According to the UK Health Minister Matt Hancock, who two cases of the highly concerning new coronavirus strain had been discovered in Britain. It is one of at least five countries and airlines that have banned flights from South Africa. Many foreigners are now stranded in South Africa as they don't know when they will be able to fly back to their countries. This new variant is highly concerning because it is yet more transmissible and it appears to have mutated further than the new variant that has been discovered in the UK. We've taken the following action. First, we are quarantining cases and close contacts of cases found here in the UK. Second, we're placing immediate restrictions on travel from South Africa. And finally, and most importantly, Anyone in the UK who has been in South Africa in the past fortnight and anyone who is a close contact of someone who's been in South Africa in the last fortnight must quarantine immediately. CGTN correspondent Sumitra Naidu is following the developments on the travel bans from Johannesburg. We haven't received any official announcement about, um, you know, about this new variant and about uh, the travel bans. But South Africa did say uh, previously anyone traveling from South Africa will have to adhere to the COVID rules and regulations of the country they're traveling to. So far, five countries have banned travel from uh, South Africa. That's Israel, Turkey, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and Switzerland. Uh, they've all halted air travel to, um, to and from South Africa. These bans will also affect international travelers that are in South Africa and want to return to any of these countries. The health department has identified it as the 501v2 variant, similar to that of the UK. It was first detected in Nelson Mandela Bay in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa and has since uh, spread to several other provinces. Now the health department has appealed to South Africans and visitors to the country to social distance, wear masks and stay away from large gatherings. We're still on level one lockdown but government has reverted to banning liquor sales over the weekend. Alcohol will only be sold Monday to Thursday from 8 to 6 p.m. All the country's public beaches will remain closed until the first week of January. The health department has also requested all public hospitals to make more beds available for COVID patients. They've also cautioned against transporting patients um, from one hospital to another as we know that you know there's this uh, second uh, this new variant actually in the second wave is taking a huge strain on the hospitals and they are running out of capacity the curfew has also been moved from 11 p.m to 4 a.m all service establishments are still to close at 10 p.m so what is this new variant of coronavirus in South Africa? Dr. Angelique Kotze, chairperson of the South African Medical Association, tells us more about it. There is two, uh, three structural um, var variances of this type of um, virus that's now current, or this lineage that's currently going around. And the one that is of extremely importance to us is the 501.v2. And um, as that is of the three, the one that spreads the fastest, and um, it seems to be 
um, uh, responsible for 90% of our current infections. Saying, in saying that, it is important to un also understand the, 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 the variant that I gave as the first um, wave is still here, it's not gone. It's just that this new one moves much faster. And then the other two mutations that, um, that is also part of this new lineage, um, less dominant at this stage, but um, it seems that they might um, have an influence on our antibodies and makes it a bit, a bit difficult for antibodies to detect. So nothing changed in the precautionary measurements that needs to be take, taken against this virus. But people, um, I think they are COVID fatigue. They do not listen anymore, especially the young people. Of concern to us, it seems that this new virus variant that we are now seeing, it's got a, um, doesn't really distinguish between whether you're young or old. And it sort of um, attacks the 20 pluses, especially if you are um, severely overweight. Meanwhile, Belgium has reopened its borders to the UK after closing them to Britons on Sunday because of the new variant of COVID-19. But people can only enter the country under strict exemptions. Belgian citizens, health professionals, diplomats and journalists on work trips are permitted to travel. Our reporter Benji Hayer was one of those on the train to Brussels out of London earlier. So I've made it to Brussels on the first Eurostar train from London since the resumption of travel. Those of us on that train amongst the first to leave the UK since London went into tier four restrictions and since almost 50 countries banned travel to the UK. No COVID-19 test was required, that's only mandatory from Christmas, but plenty of questions from border police about why we were making that journey. And at King's Cross, also, the train for Paris was departing. The line there, quite considerable. French citizens, British nationals living in France can travel outside the UK to France, providing they've had a recent negative test. The train to Brussels, though, practically empty. Not many people on that train whatsoever. And as we went through the British countryside, we saw that backlog of lorries sitting there, not able to take goods from the UK to France. They won't be able to move necessarily until they have a negative test as well. But here in Brussels, although the numbers travelling from the UK are low, travel resuming once again. Benji Hire, CGTN, Brussels. The Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is warning people across the continent to avoid unnecessary travel and gatherings during this festive season. A second wave of COVID-19 infections has hit parts of Africa, and there is even more concern of widespread infections after South Africa reported a new strain of the virus that experts believe spreads much faster. CGTN's Coletta Wanjohi reports from Addis Ababa. Traveling to celebrate with family is the norm in Africa during such a festive season. But this year, experts are warning that traveling and mass gatherings may lead to increased spread of the coronavirus. Let's go celebrating with a theme, a common theme that are called save, COVID save festivity end of year uh, season. COVID save festivity end of year season, which means I am here because my, uh, my, my neighbor is, is there. So that it means I have to protect myself and protect my neighbor. And the way to do that is that we, uh, we wear the mask, we distance, we celebrate even indoors with uh, the appropriate social distancing, recognizing that uh, statistics are showing us that one in five transmissions will occur in those kind of settings. And you never know. International travel has also been affected this festive season. A new strain of the virus is now being reported in the United Kingdom. In Africa, South Africa is reporting a similar trend, which health experts in the country say may be driving a second wave of infections. Germany, Turkey, Israel, Switzerland and Saudi Arabia are some of the countries that have restricted travel to and from South Africa, which is currently reporting about 10,000 new cases daily. The Africa CDC says for now, wearing masks, washing hands and practicing physical distancing remain the most effective ways to curb infections. As a continent, uh, if you look at the number of new cases, daily new cases, there we are very close to where we were at the peak of the pandemic in, in July, August. Okay, July, August time frame, uh, we are recording uh, close to uh, uh, 17,000, uh, 16,000 cases, and now we are closely uh, close to that number, if not at that number now. So my projection is that with the holiday season coming, 
uh, we will probably exceed that number by January uh, or uh, February or January. Absolutely no doubt about that. But as the cases rise, Kenya and Ethiopia's national carriers are getting ready to transport vaccines when they become available. At the Bole International Airport in Addis Ababa, the cargo section is ready to handle vaccines. Ethiopian Airlines has acquired machines called cool dollies to ensure that the vaccines are transported at their right temperatures from the storage rooms to the aircrafts. At least 28 aircrafts have been set aside to transport vaccines. They have different uh, uplift uh, capacity. For example, we can uplift up to 65 tons with the 777-300, uh, Airbus up to 55 tons, uh, 787900 uh, up to 50 tons. So these different uh, uplift capacities have their own temperature control also. So they are latest, they can be adjustable into the temperature requirement of the pharmaceuticals or the vaccines. The airline says it has already secured an order to transport vaccines from China to Brazil and Uganda in less than a month's time. COVAX, the global initiative to ensure rapid and equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, says it has secured agreements for 2 billion doses of vaccine candidates, which are still under development. They will be sent to 92 countries, including African states. Vaccines may be on their way, but health experts are urging people to take precautions to stay safe over the holiday season. Koleto Anjohi for CGTN in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Let's now head to the Central African Republic, where the fourth largest town, which was seized by rebels Tuesday ahead of elections this weekend, is now back in the hands of United Nations peacekeepers and government forces. Abdulaziz Fali, who is the United Nations spokesman for the peacekeeping force in the CAR, said the situation in the town of Bambari is now under control. He also said civilians are returning after the armed groups were pushed out of the town. Rwanda and Russia confirmed sending troops into the Central African nation to help in containing the escalating situation. Earlier, the government had accused ex-president Francois Bozizé of plotting a coup with armed groups ahead of presidential and legislative elections on Sunday. The United Nations World Food Programme has warned that it will reduce monthly relief cash and food rations for 1.2 million refugees in Uganda due to a funding shortfall. The reductions are expected to start in February 2021. Leon Sinyange reports. According to the Food Agency, refugees will have to make do with only 60% of a full food ration. With a looming food shortage, there is a growing fear about the survival of thousands of refugees over the next few months. The most vulnerable are women, children and elderly who are increasingly at risk of becoming malnourished. The impact of COVID-19 lockdowns is already a major contributor to hunger in the 13 refugee settlements that suffered acute food insecurity. Earlier this year, refugee rations were reduced by 30%. The WFP says it needs over $95 million to provide full rations to refugees in Uganda over the next six months. Uganda currently hosts more than 1.4 million refugees, most coming from South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Leon Senyange, CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. It's coming up to 14 minutes into the hour. You're watching Africa Live. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back with plenty more. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Syria, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. I try to not let it affect me, but there are days when it does. I'm a human being, and to see patients in a hospital bed and their family members are not there there's no one there to hold their hand that that human touch you know i just hope everyone can 
remember that the situation is not permanent and that everything will get better eventually. The United States Navy has deployed an aircraft carrier off the Somali coast as Washington embarks on a massive pullout of its troops stationed in Somalia. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilo is in Mogadishu and reports on how the pullout could affect years of efforts to tackle terrorism in the Horn of African nation. The U.S. has deployed this ship off the coast of Somalia. The USS Marking Island is part of a maritime expeditionary unit tasked with overseeing the withdrawal of American troops in Somalia. As part of the plan, 700 military personnel will be repositioned to other operation zones in East Africa, including Kenya, where Washington has a base in the coastal town of Mombasa. The removal of American forces on the ground is part of U.S. President Donald Trump's efforts to pull back forces globally, a move that experts have termed as a very dangerous gamble. It's a terrible decision for the Somalis and it's a terrible decision for the Americans. Al-Shabaab will be only the beneficiaries and they will celebrate. Equally, it will devastate the Somali security and the army so. In a statement, the U.S. Africa Command says the pullout will not affect its anti-insurgency campaign. The U.S. has warned the Al-Qaeda affiliated group against threatening its interests in the region. Since 2017, after Donald Trump assumed office, the number of airstrikes targeting the Al-Shabaab in Somalia increased, degrading the group's ability to carry out large-scale attacks. Drone has had a great impact because our Shabaab do not use the military capability or capacity. The vehicles has been abandoned or hidden under the trees for almost three, four years now. Uh, because of the drones, they were not traveling with the military vehicles. They were not traveling with the convoys. They were only fighting on the infantries and the manpowers on the ground. And you see the devastation and the scale of attacks they have impact on the Somali security and Amazon. So imagine if the drones and Americans are gone on the, you know, on the, from the ground, uh, what impact that will have on the security. America is among several countries training Somali forces as Mogadishu plans to take over security responsibilities. A good example of security cooperation between the two countries is the formation of DANAP, an elite special unit of the Somali army critical in counter-terrorism operations. In the past two years, DANAP has managed to push back Al-Shabaab from the lower Shabele region, denying it the ability to strike army and civilian targets in southern Somalia, including the capital Mogadishu. I'm not sure how DANAP will manage to do so. They don't only pay the salary, they control. They, you know, they, they build the, they sometimes go, you know, on, on, on the ground operations with them. They fly with them to the, to the helicopter gunships. Um, you know, sometimes they raid Al Shabaab within the Americans, and you know, fighting alongside your your trainers, it helps you a lot to to fulfill your your combat training. And I think that was that was very effective for the last few years. Somalia is heading to the polls next month, with the country set to elect members of parliament, senators, and a new president. The insurgent group has threatened to disrupt the electoral process. Last week, the country's prime minister luckily survived an attack that targeted him. That's after a suicide bomber detonated explosives outside a parked stadium in Galkayo, where the Somali premier was due to make an appearance. The attack killed scores, including several top army commanders, leading the fight against the Al Shabaab in Puntland and Gelmuduk regions. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Nigeria has begun reinstating some restrictions it had lifted earlier after a second COVID-19 wave hit the country. The reintroduced measures are aimed at stopping large gatherings as health, health authorities battle the increasing coronavirus cases. CGTN's Deji Badmas has that story. Following the recent spike in COVID-19 infections, the government has been forced to act quickly. The Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 has announced the reintroduction of measures to stop the spread of the virus. We would be presenting to the states our advisories with regards to A, to consider closing all bars, nightclubs, pubs and event centers and recreational venues for the next five weeks. 
close all the restaurants except those providing services to hotel residents, takeaways, home deliveries, and drive-in. Restrict all informal and formal festivity events, including weddings, conferences, congresses, office parties, concerts, seminars, sporting activities, end of year events, to a number of 50 persons. D, limit all gatherings linked to religious events to less than 50% capacity of the facility, during which physical distancing, mandatory use of face masks shall be strictly enforced. The restrictions also include limiting the number of passengers in commercial vehicles to 50% of their capacity, the enforcement of the use of face masks in public places, and other category of government workers should work from home for the next five weeks. The chair of the tax force stopped short of placing restrictions on international flights, something quite a number of people have been calling for. The PTF, the Aviation Authority, and the health authorities, including the World Health Organization, are assessing the situation closely and will take a position as soon as cogent scientific bases are established. For bars and nightclubs like this one, the restriction is a big blow to business. It only just fully reopened about two months ago after shutting down for over six months during the first wave of the virus. Managers of the club say another closure will hit them hard. Since like nine months now, no salary for my workers, no salary for me. So I don't know where the government is taking this to if they are bringing back the lockdown because it will actually affect everybody, actually affect me and my family and my workers too. I'm not going to tell the government how to run their business because I'm not a health personnel, but uh, they should at least, we should adhere to the precaution of the COVID-19. But the lockdown again will be just so, to just be so, the effect will be so disastrous. With Nigeria currently dealing with an economic recession, Authorities will be doing all they can to avoid a lockdown. But a continued spike in COVID-19 infections could make things even more difficult for the government and could force it to make a choice between economics and health. We are in for a very difficult time. But I know with the support of Nigerians, with your cooperation in the media, we can wither this storm. We can navigate these difficult times. In the meantime, President Mohamedou Buhari has extended the mandate of the COVID-19 tax force to March next year, saying it's still needed. It was expected to finish its operations by the end of this year. Dejibadmo, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. In Kenya, a local lawyer has been fighting his battles in the courtrooms and in boxing rings. Lawyer Shang Drakwamboi has been empowering people living in the slums of Nairobi with boxing skills, as well as teaching them basic issues on human rights. Growing up in the slums of Nairobi was a tough call for lawyer Shang Drakwamboi. Witnessing the almost daily acts of violence from police officers, and even his fellow slum dwellers often left him an angry man. He thus chose boxing as an avenue of venting his pent-up anger. Now, as a lawyer, he has not stopped fighting. I, I find it very easy combining being a boxer and being a lawyer because on, on one field, on one end, I fight for people's causes. I fight for people's lives, I fight for people's uh, livelihoods, I fight for people's inheritance, I, I fight for people's lives, literally speaking. When you are representing people who, upon conviction, might get a sentence of up to death, so you realize that you're fighting for people's lives. Wamboi has teamed up with his fellow young lawyers to form an organization called Sharia Mtani, which means law in the streets in Swahili. The aim is to teach young men and women the basics in law, especially on matters touching on human rights. He draws his inspiration from common pillars of wisdom and leadership on the African continent. It will be remembered that Nelson Madiba Mandela, Rohinlala, was also a boxer and a lawyer. So really, being a boxer is about fighting. Being a lawyer is about fighting. So the causes are the ones that differ. But both 
uh, the, the martial art and the profession require some sense of um, commitment. They require an inner drive and inner, uh, I mean, you, you must have that inner encouragement. You must encourage yourself. To reach his targets, he organizes boxing coaching sessions which culminate in talks on law. This is delivered in the local slang called Sheng, which mixes English, Swahili, and local languages. All these drawn from a childhood full of mixed memories. Through the hands of the police officers, I lost, we lost livelihoods and we also lost loved ones. So I grew up knowing that I, I wanted to be counter these police officers. But really the idea of becoming a lawyer, I learned of it in, in class 8 and class 7. That there, were this, there, there was this profession known as the legal, uh, legal uh, practitioners or the legal profession that if you enrolled in it, it will help you in championing your course. So but that is how I, I, I now embarked on my journey to becoming an advocate. Human rights violations often occur in informal settlements and villages in Kenya. And police officers often get linked to these acts. Domestic violence also accounts for a fair share of these incidents. For Shadrach, victims have a better way of seeking their revenge. And this is by sparring and empowering themselves on legal issues. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Dealing with trash is a headache to many, if not all cities. Nairobi, the capital of Kenya, which generates about 500 metric tons of plastic waste every day, is not an exception. Nzambi Mate recently got awarded by the United Nations as one of the seven young champions of the Earth 2020. But how is she changing the dynamic by turning trash into cash? Take a look. It's hard to imagine these colorful paving blocks as plastic waste. Nzambi Mate, the brain behind these blocks, says it's been a long journey, one full of challenges. The reason why I started this was uh, I was tired of just being uh, like on the sideline, just waiting, uh, complaining, oh, the government needs to do something about plastic waste. So we decided, uh, let, me, let me do it myself. Uh, before I started the Jijenge, uh, I was employed in the oil and gas sector. I was a data analyst. And during that period of time, uh, I realized there was something missing. So in 2016, uh, end of 2016, I quit my job. Initially, Nzambi and her colleagues were collecting, sorting, then selling the plastic waste to certain companies. They then realized that they were collecting more than they could sell and came up with a better solution of recycling the waste. That's when we made the first prototype, the, the first brick. It was not the best. But it proved a concept. It proved the concept that you can convert plastic waste into an alternative building product. But then during that period, because we were just uh, prototyping, we didn't generate any income, um, the friends left. So I was uh, left alone. Nzambi says her journey to success has been very tough, but giving up has never been an option. In 2018, she received a scholarship and attended a program in the United States where she furthered her prototype research and successfully made satisfactory yeah. bricks. A year later, Nzambi returned to Kenya with her invention, Jijenge pavers, which are not only more affordable compared to conventional building materials, but also have many other advantages. The Jijenge pavers, in comparison to the concrete pavers, is first of all, this one is three times stronger than the normal concrete. The second one is the wear and tear. So because we use plastic uh, in the, as a binding agent, so therefore it doesn't break easily. Plastic, uh, as we all know, plastic takes a very long time to, to decompose or to degrade. And so by that virtue, we are able to project this one may take almost between 30 to 50 years before it even just starts degrading. Recently, the United Nations Environment Program named seven young people worldwide as its 2020 Young Champions of the Earth. Nzambi Mate was the regional winner for Africa. It's a huge morale booster, first of all, because at least uh, it shows that someone has seen the, the work we're doing. The first of all is follow your dreams and just do it. Just start, no matter how small uh, it is, as long as it's something that um, fulfills you at the end of the day just start because you never know how far it will go and then the other one is you know possibilities are endless so 
you just have to create them. Currently, Jijenge produces 1,500 paving blocks on a daily basis. The company plans to add two more production lines, which means more plastic waste for recycling. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Let's now catch up with the day's business news, and for that, we cross over to Rama. Thank you very much, Penina. Here's what's coming up in business. South Africa's fuel supplies are stretched thin following the closure of two of its largest domestic refineries. And businesses in Somalia gain momentum after the government lifts some pandemic restrictions. The details coming up next. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Let's start with a story of uh, global dimension, if you will. The World Brand Lab has released its 2020 list of the 500 most influential brands around the world. Amazon, Google and Microsoft are in the top three. 43 Chinese brands are also on the list, three more than in 2019. China surpassed the UK for the first time this year, ranking fourth among the countries. State Grid is the highest ranking Chinese firm in the 25th spot. Tencent and Higher come in second and third as far as the, being the highest ranking Chinese firms are concerned. An industrial equipment brand also made the list, Shuzhou Construction Machinery Group. You and I probably know it by its more common name, XEMG. This is the second, second consecutive year in which it's in that list. The list has been published every year since 2004. It tracks three indicators, market share, brand loyalty and global leadership. The key reason why we can consistently increase the creativity and influence of XCMG brand it is that we have always adhered to sustainable development strategy in the company's development. We always see the corporate social responsibility as an important measure for increasing brand values. Back to the continent, South Africa's fuel supplies are expected to remain stretched with two of its largest refineries out of commission. Both plants were closed following explosions. The blast at the Astro Energy facility in Cape Town in July claimed the lives of two people. There were no injuries at the engine blast early in December, but having both facilities out of commission does further constrain local supply. Here's the GTN's Julie Shire with the details. South Africa is a net importer of crude oil, with Cape Town's Astron Energy refinery closed. An explosion at Durban's engine in early December added further pressure to the fuel supply. When you've got an incident like that, you need to immediately look at how can you source products outside the country. We have started to see imports lending into the country to make sure that I mean, uh, there is supply of products. So the situation is under control, even though like there might be still rationing of stocks. Fuel stocks are expected to hold up despite the closure of the Durban refinery, but the incident has raised questions over risks faced by the communities who live in close proximity to these plants. Something is fundamentally wrong when it comes to maintenance, because if, if these plants are really adhering to, the, I mean, to their own safety measures, and safety measures which are actually legislated. I don't think we'll be having this problem. Internal and government investigations are expected to provide more clues on the cause of the blast. There's an uh, in investigation in, in terms of the government by the Department of Labor. So we'll got to get to know what will have caused the, the incident from their side. And then the idea is for us to learn like so that other companies cannot sort of from, find themselves in a similar situation. I would like to see the local authorities who hold engine accountable if there were any non-compliance. But in the long term, we need to really find alternative means of generating energy. And we don't see the use of fossil fuels being best for the environment and for people. These incidents highlight the risks of South Africa's dependence on fossil fuels. 
In light of this, community and environmental organizations are calling for the country's renewable energy program to be fast-tracked. Julie Shara, CGTN, Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, before the COVID-19 pandemic, South Africa used to receive over 10 million tourists a year. Today, the tourism sector is having to make do with a 90% decline in tourist traffic and a surge in new infections is lowering the odds of their survival. President Cyril Ramaphosa announced tighter restrictions last week to curb the spread of COVID-19, but that move was opposed by enterprises which have been battered by the pandemic all year. Here's CGTN's Sumitra Naidu with that story. South Africa is a populous tourist destination, boasting picturesque mountains, lush forests and blue flag beaches. While it's hot and sunny for most of the year, December is most popular amongst both local and international tourists who flock to the country's coastlines. However, many of these beaches will be closed to the public this year. In the areas with the highest rate of infection, beaches and public parks will be closed for the duration of the festive season from the 16th of December to the 3rd of January. This will apply specifically to all of the Eastern Cape, as well as the Garden Route District in the Western Cape. With daily infection rates rising by over 10,000 this week, the COVID Command Council has agreed to impose tighter restrictions in hotspot regions. The curfew is now from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m., all restaurants and bars catering to holiday makers will have to close early. It will impact tourism. That's 100% uh, I'm sure about that. Uh, on the basis that many people travel to the coastal areas of our country are going there uh, for beach purposes or water sports uh, purposes. We started to see this in the Garden Route area. Uh, we saw this again in the Kesetan area where some people just uh, decided that they won't go on, on holiday. South Africa is open for tourism. Almost all travel bans have been lifted, except for certain restrictions on a few public beaches. But it's going to take a long time before the tourism sector can get back to pre-pandemic levels, especially with many people too afraid to leave home and others reluctant to spend. Tourism contributes over $28 billion to South Africa's GDP. The sector is also an important employer, accounting for over 1.5 million jobs. It's the one sector of the economy that has recorded consistent growth. I have 22 staff members. We have concerns about how, how are we going to do this a second time? How are we going to save our staff? I think we'll, we'll be lucky to do 35% of, of what we normally would do in, in December time. The curfew really strikes at, at, at the peak of the nightlife, which is, which is understandable, to be honest. While growth is still expected, a strong rebound may take longer than anticipated. Sumit Renadu, CGT in Johannesburg, South Africa. On to Somalia now. Business activity for there is gaining momentum. Months after the federal government lifted restrictions designed to slow the spread of COVID-19, privately owned enterprises were hardest hit by this pandemic, and many of them were compelled to either shut down or drastically downsize. CGTN's Abdulaziz Billow takes up that story. Ikhra Abdi Hashi is restocking her store after receiving a shipment of clothes, shoes and bags from abroad. Hashi deals in women's wear, importing her products mainly from the Middle East and Asia. At her store in Mogadishu, business is slowly booming after months of uncertainty. Hashi is among thousands of traders whose import businesses have been hardest hit by the coronavirus pandemic. The effects have been wide-ranging. The first three months was the worst in terms of trade and imports. I was even unable to return to the country after flying out on a business trip to purchase more goods for my shop. In March, the Somali government imposed a ban on all passenger and cargo flights as part of measures to limit the spread of the virus, with the exception of humanitarian flights. For Hashi and other small medium-sized enterprises, accessing the global market and delivery of goods was the biggest challenge. I was unable to get cargo services, and in case we got a flight, cargo service was not offered at the old rate we were accustomed to. Basically, we had to pay more for the normal services. This was bad for business. Amina Salat is one of Hashi's clients. She has come to check on some of the latest arrivals. The pandemic affected her graduation and that of her friends after Hashi failed to deliver their order due to lack of cargo services. 
During the first early months of the pandemic, we were unable to buy designer clothes from this shop, and it was our graduation. We placed an order of a set of new clothes of the same type, but it was impossible to get them. COVID-19 ruined our graduation plans. In October, the World Bank said Somalia's economy is expected to shrink by 2.5% this year, revising its initial forecast of 3.2% growth due to the impact of the coronavirus crisis. Abdurrahman Duale Bayla is Somalia's finance minister. He says the pandemic affected domestic revenue, with growth expected to rebound to 2.9% next year and 3.2% in 2022. The pandemic uh, hit us uh, uh, less than we expected. In the beginning, uh, we all thought that uh, the revenue will decline by 40%. We now see that it was, it was much better than we expected. Uh, maybe 10 to 15 percent decline. Uh, that, that's how much it has affected. Somalia's private sector has slowly risen and has now become a key driver of the economy, employing thousands of jobs and creating conditions for future generations of entrepreneurs to flourish. Across the country, many young people, including recent university graduates, are creating startup companies with leading banks providing financial assistance. Abdulaziz Bilon, CGTN, Mogadishu. Somalia. Away from the continent, in China, a World Bank report says economic activity in the country has normalized much faster than expected. That report estimates that China's real GDP growth will slow down to 2%, still positive. And remember, we're talking about the second largest economy in the world here, 2% in 2020 before accelerating to just under 8% next year. The forecast comes as consumer spending and business investment continue to rise, along with improving corporate margins, better labor market conditions and incomes too. But the Bretton Woods body says that the pandemic has exacerbated imbalances in China's economy, especially with regard to relatively high public and private levels of debt, as well as the worsening frictions with major trading partners. In short, payout due to damage done by natural catastrophes and man-made disasters around the world amounted to $83 billion this year. Now, according to CIS3, that's a global reinsurance firm, that makes 2020 the fifth costliest year for the industry since 1970. Natural catastrophes triggered some $76 billion of insurance payouts worldwide. That's 40% more compared to 2019. The bulk of the damage was caused by severe storms and wildfires in the United States. A very active North Atlantic hurricane season also triggered an additional $20 billion of insurance claims. But that was moderate compared to the record seasons of 2005 and 2017. That's because hurricanes did not hit densely populated areas this year. Other events included severe floods in several provinces along the Yangtze River in China back in May and triggered insurance payouts of roughly two billion U.S. dollars. I'll leave you there for the time being, but I'll be back at the top of the hour. In global business, we'll be getting a lot more insights on this new coronavirus strain that's been found in South Africa. It's being cited as a cause for a surge in COVID-19 cases. What effect will that have, however, on Africa's most industrialized economy? We'll have some details live from Johannesburg at 1800 GMT. See you then. For now, back to Benina. Thank you, Rama. You're watching Africa Live coming up in sports. Kenyan striker Olunga scoops top award at the J-League Football Awards. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports Scene. Find your game. Africa Live. Find your voice.
The J-League annual awards were held in Tokyo on Tuesday and Kashiwa Resol's Kenyan striker Michael Olunga was named the most valuable player and champions Kawasaki Frontalis coach 